One extra note is that one of the things we want to do is for Ken and Bruce, we want to have a special gift for them. So if you'd like to contribute to it, you can put it in an envelope, say for Ken and Bruce, and uh, we'll make sure at the end of December we give them those. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. When he was announcing it, when he mentioned about writing the dissertation and wanting Jesus to write it, I wish there were a couple times he'd do that for me, too. <laughs> it didn't happen. But we do appreciate that Ken was, uh, saw the need and was willing to bite the bullet and, and step down on his own accord. Most of us remember where we were this past week when we heard the news of the act of terrorism. Since then, I've, we've heard stories. I've heard many stories about Trinity Church, uh, about one of our first responders uh, canceling his own Cornelia group to be there. Thank God for first responders and, and the way that they processed all of this. Uh, people at Loma Linda Hospital, when the, the, the bomb threat came and they, had, they were there, uh, many stories that Steve has alluded to and others affected by it. One of the reporters in reporting the news talked about the, the fear that uh, he sensed in, uh, in the area, which is totally understandable because fear is natural during times like that. And today we want to focus on how the Advent can address those fears because the word of the day for this advent is hope that we have hope because of Christmas Jesus coming the babe in Bethlehem gives us hope our hope is not in that our president would finally say there is a war on terror the hope is not in anything happening to deal with radical Islam I mean you read the book of the Revelation you know that things like that are going to happen and even worse but our hope is in the Lord and our hope especially comes from what we read in the book of Isaiah where he weaves around the concept of Emmanuel God with us you know that great verse that the virgin would conceive and give birth to a child and would name him Emmanuel God with us now we're going to look at a story in Isaiah which covers chapters 7, 8, and 9 and I love the Old Testament stories because they, it gives us, I mean it's, stories are a big thing right now aren't they? Communication and they've always been to communicate truth and uh, Isaiah weaves his story around three names of boy, little boys two of them we know are his sons and one of course the one I just mentioned we're not sure. We know it, of course, is the Messiah. It's direct prophetic reference to Jesus. But it might have been Isaiah's son or someone else. We're not certain about that. But that doesn't matter. But, you know, when we have fears, it's hard to trust in God, isn't it? I remember in Iowa City many years ago, I heard Elie Wiesel speak. He was a Holocaust survivor. And he wrote, he had just written the book Night at that time, and he was going around sh talking about it, and he was sharing a story from it when he was in the prison camp. And they were out in this field, and it was dismal, gray, gloomy, and uh, the Germans were killing children and, and women and even men. And all of a sudden, somebody wailed out, Where is God now? And it's hard to imagine that when we're struggling with fears. But the message of the Advent is that there is hope in the midst of all of that. In Isaiah 7 and verse 3, he mentions his first son. Go you out, you and your son Shirah Jeshub. And my Bible has a footnote, a remnant will return. Now, that's quite a creative way to name a kid. Then Isaiah 8 and verse 1, his second son. Meher Shalal Hashbaz, which means quick to the plunder, swift to the spoil. I can imagine t that sounds like a terrible two name, but whatever. Isaiah is giving us a story and a truth that has a deeper message. Now, 
if you know anything about this passage, it was written about 734 B.C. 734. Now, those of you who are uh, Old Testament scholars know that in 722, 12 years later, remember, in B.C., the numbers go down. A.D., they go up, right? So 19, uh, or 2016 will follow 2015, but it's a reverse on B.C., and 734 was 12 years before 722. And in 722 was the Assyrian captivity, which took the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, into captivity. Remember, after Solomon died, Israel divided into two, north and south. Judah, the north, Israel, the southern kingdom. Now, in Isaiah 7, 1, when Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, king, of, king Rezin of Aram and Pekah, son of Remaliah, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Now, the house of David was told, Aram was, has allied himself with Ephraim, so the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by wind. Now, that's picturesque, isn't it? Have you ever been so afraid that you're just shaking? I mean, I've had that happen. And that's what's here. What do we have as political intrigue? King Ahaz, king of Israel, is afraid that the Assyrians are going to invade and destroy the nation. So there's political alliances, political intrigue, terror that's taking place. And Isaiah is told, go out, you and your son, meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field. Say to him, be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Wow. Timely words, even today, aren't they? But in this political alliance, this fear that's taking place on a geopolitical scale, even as we see today, Ahaz was afraid, but his message has been, do not be afraid. And notice, he goes on to write in verse 10, again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. Now wait a minute, Ahaz. You're doing what f fear does to everybody else. We do stupid things, don't we? Have you ever talked to someone who's afraid? They're so irrational. So some of those, we saw some interviews this past week of people. They're so afraid, and the things that they would say are irrational, not rooted in reality. And that's where Ahaz was. He said, I'm going to put the Lord to the test. <laughs> then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? Now, here's something to note, my friend. Underline it. Put a frowny face by it. Put arrows, whatever, however you mark your Bible. But when you and I are afraid, no matter what it is, it, not just an act of terror, but any fear that causes gloom in your life, you're actually testing the patience of God because God's told you and me to trust in him with all of our heart and not lean to our own understanding and all our ways acknowledge him and he'll direct our paths but we're afraid and we're testing the patience of God now what's key here as I already mentioned this captivity will happen to Israel 12 years later I mean to Judah not to Israel not to Ahaz Ahaz doesn't, ha doesn't have to worry about a thing. I mean, Ahaz, uh, the captivity Ahaz should be concerned about is the Babylonian captivity, which will be 586 B.C. That dude will be pushing daisies long before they go into the Babylonian captivity. He does not need to be afraid. But he is, because he, surprise of surprise, he's a politician, and he doesn't understand what's happening, does he? <laughs> That's, I remember when 9-11 happened, many of us pastors stood in the pulpit and said, our politicians don't understand what happened this past Tuesday. And that's true. They still haven't caught up with it. Some are a lot later and haven't caught on to what's going on. Now, our weapons are the weapons not of the world, but we have weapons 
of our warfare as Christians that we need to understand and we need to utilize it. Part of praying this morning was that. We need to pray about this issue, not go to war, but we need to understand what's happening here. So here, Ahaz is afraid. Now that's the story, but I want to unpack that because there's so many fears that we have. I'm still looking. My patron saint, Ray Stedman, said there are 365 commands. Do not be afraid in the Bible. One for every day. Now, I've gotten a little past 300, and I haven't found them all yet, but the, re the point is that we have so many things to be afraid about, don't we? That cause us fears. Let me unpack it a little bit. Just suggest some. It's only suggestions. One fear is the fear of failure. No one likes to fail. When a teacher asks a question, why do we not put our hands up and answer it? Unless we want to be a brownie. But uh, we don't want to have the wrong answer, do we? Somebody asks us and there's silence. I'm reminded of that, of the youth pastor that was asking the youth group, what's brown and fuzzy and has a long tail and eats nuts? Silence. Finally, one young person said, I think... The answer you want is Jesus, but it sounds like a squirrel to me. <laughs> we don't want to be, we don't, we don't want to make a fail. You want to fail in front of everybody. But that's a strong fear. But remember, remember every person in the Bible except Jesus was a failure at something in his or her life. I mean, some really bad. Moses, who's revered to this day as a great leader in Israel, a murderer, a fugitive from justice, one who gave excuses that he couldn't speak for God, and so God had to make adjustments. Paul, in the New Testament, killed Christians in pursuing truth. I mean, God's in the business of taking failures and turning them into somebodies. So, no big deal. But we're afraid and embarrassed to fail. Another fear that we have is the fear of death. Now, the last time I checked, the death rate is one per person. You know, unless Jesus comes back the second time, we're all going to die. Now, it's not pleasant to think about. We had a, our next-door neighbor uh, the week before Thanksgiving died in the middle of the night in his, in his bed. Marilyn said, that's the way I want to go. I said, that's the way I want to go too. But we don't know how we're going to go. But we're all going to have to face that. And it's a reality. But some people are afraid of dying. One of the things John Wesley said, the good thing about the early Methodists is that we die well. Now, today, of all people, the people who should die well are evangelical Christians. Not just evangelical free church, but evangelical Christians. Why? Because we, we know where we're going. We have a hope. Our hope is the Christ of the cosmos became the babe in Bethlehem, and that advent gives us hope to face life, even death. But people do wild and crazy things to avoid death, don't they? We spend lots of money. Another fear that people have is the fear of being rejected. Now, we all have had rejection of some kind or another. You know, I was, uh, well, probably too old, but I'm, I'm slow, so it, took me, it takes me longer to catch on. But one day I finally caught on that my struggle with God over the death of my dad, he died when I was uh, uh, ready to turn nine years of age. And... Uh, I felt I had felt rejected by God. I, I couldn't I couldn't put a term on it until I read a I read some psychological books on it and was insight on it. And I was struggling with the fact that I felt rejected by God. Now we do stupid things when we feel rejected, and we all get rejected. Maybe someone you want to connect with, and you you make a step forward and you commit yourself, and they cut you off, and you feel rejected. I mean. Some people go the rest of their lives scarred because of that. Nobody likes to be rejected. Another fear that we have is 
of being honest and authentic and transparent with one another. John Powell, in his book, he wrote many years ago, Why am I afraid to tell you who I am? I'm afraid to tell you who I am because after I tell you who I am, if you don't like me, I have nothing else to give. I can't, we can't connect. And we have that fear of being transparent. Back in the 1980s, there was a book written. The title was The Trauma of Transparency. And we all know that. Husbands and wives know that, of being honest and really truthful with one another. And it's in all of our relationships because we have a fear of that. Somebody has described Christians this way. We're like two porcupines on a cold winter night. We desperately need one another for warmth to try to get together. And as soon as we come together, we needle each other away. And we do that with one another in the church, don't we? It's hard to really love one another. And of all places, this is where we're supposed to love. And we should have insight into that. I mean, I don't, I, I don't blame the world for their stupid th concept of love and, and all these issues of, of homosexuality and, and all of our culture about love. And you see these dumb, soapy, uh, s sappy commercials about love. But we know what love is. It's clearly defined in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Those four, 14 qualities about love, what love is. And we should be able to love one another, but we can't be transparent and honest with one another. And then one last fear is we have the fear of unknown. Someone has put it this way, we're down on what we're not up on. That's why we don't like change. We're afraid of the unknown. Change? You know, we've never done it that way before. I remember for years I kept a little cartoon from Leadership Journal in my uh, sermon notebook, and... Uh, it was a, a pastor was changing a light bulb, and a parishioner said, Pastor, my grandmother gave that light bulb. <laughs> we don't like change because it's unknown. We are down on what we're not up on. It's like, you know, I have a gripe with these text, you know, TV. They say, text in your opinion of this. Well, I don't know what that committee was doing. Those people who were responsible for making that decision. I may disagree with it, but that's irrelevant because I don't know what caused them to make that decision, but so I don't have a right to be critical of it. But we're down on what we're not up on, and we fear the unknown. Now, fears are natural, okay? But the rest of Isaiah in this story, chapter 8, 11 through 9, 21, is telling us that the cure is supernatural. In your Bible, you may have a note, as mine did, at the beginning of Isaiah 8, verse 11, in bold print, it says, Fear God. Now, that's the cure. And that is supernatural, to fear God. Notice Isaiah writes, The Lord spoke to me with his strong hand upon me. You know, when you're afraid, you need somebody strong to stabilize you, right? You're, you're falling apart. Get a hold of yourself. Don't be so shaken on this. The strong hand of the Lord is upon him, warning me not to follow the way of this people. Do not call conspiracy everything that these people call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear, and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread, and he will be your sanctuary. You see... It's learning how to fear God. Whether it's an act of terror or any of these fears that I mentioned or some other fear that may be a cloud in your life, may be causing you depression and discouragement at this time in your spiritual journey. Whatever that is, you need to comprehend how do you cure this fear. Well, I think the best definition in the Bible I've found is fearing the Lord is in the book of Deuteronomy. Now in Deuteronomy, that's Moses' valedictory address. That's his farewell. He's, he's, going to go, he's going to die. Remember, he can't go into the promised land. Even though he's 120 years old and he is a lot better shape than I am at 70 and he's in great shape and nothing's diminished, he's going to die because he struck the rock, remember? His anger got him in trouble. But 
nevertheless, he gives them the philosophy of why they were in the wilderness. Important truth he gives. And he tells them that they need to fear God. And in Deuteronomy 10 and verse 12, he says, o not, And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God. And here's what fear is. To walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees I'm giving you today for your own good. That's what fearing God... It isn't a dreadful fear that God's going to zap you, or God's against fun, or God hates something you're doing. That's not fear. Fear is reverencing God, acknowledging who God is, and learning to love God in the midst of the circumstances. Remember, Jesus said the first commandment is love God with your total being. With your mind, your will, your emotions. Now, I'm a philosopher at heart, and I like to think. I tell Marilyn when she's trying to get my attention, and you know, on the third time, she, I haven't heard her, so I say, I'm contemplating the universe. I'm thinking. But I can get my mind around things a lot faster than I can get my feelings around it. And I can get that faster around my feelings. And sometimes my will, you know, our will is really where we struggle, isn't it? We're the master of our faith, the captain of our souls. We want to be in control. And yet we need to learn to love God with that total being. And to acknowledge his ways and to bring our fears into light of his word. So let's go back and touch upon these fears I mentioned. Let's talk about failure. The world doesn't like people who fail, do they? I mean, look at our, look at our sports crazy people. You know, as long as a team is winning, they'll buy the jerseys, right? You'll see them advertised on TV, but... You know, when there has been some other team, right? That's the world. It doesn't like losers. And you and I are cast away if we're perceived as a loser in the eyes of the world. But in the church, it shouldn't be that way. When we fail, and we will, Pastor Next will fail you at some time or another, just as Pastor Past has. We're human. When you fail... In the church, there should be acceptance and love. But what happens? I've seen this over 40-some years. When a person fails, their marriage falls apart, or they're caught with, in drugs, or caught uh, on, the, on the Internet viewing pornography, or they've, they've embezzled money from their company or something. They failed in some way. What do they do? They cut and run from the church. It's the church where you should go, and it's in the church where we should accept one another. We shouldn't be so self-righteous that we condemn them, but we realize that all of us fails. And it's the grace of God that can restore people and can renew people and use them. So just because you fail, join the human race. I mean, that's, that's what it is. The fear of death. I've done well over 200 funerals in my ministry. So I've seen the whole spectrum of people and the way they've died and all of that. And I've seen people who are afraid of dying, afraid of death. But we need to embrace it and know that that's, that's part of our journey. It's not the end of our journey. The grave isn't where it ends. It's, as I mentioned in that series in heaven, it's a doorway cut in sod to eternity. That's our entry into heaven, but we shouldn't be afraid of it. And, you know, with all the funerals I've done, I spend some time in, in, in cemeteries, and I'll read uh, tombstones from time to time. Uh, you know, the one like, uh, I told you I was sick, and uh, <laughs> one that somebody gave me between services. Uh, let's see. The atheist who is all dressed up and no place to go. <laughs> uh, but this one is supposed to be in Indiana. I never did find it, but I'm, I looked for it a bit. It's, it has, it's this. Friend, as you walk by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, soon you will be. Prepare for death to follow me. 
and some wag added to it, added this to it. To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> so the way to prepare for death is to know Jesus. And, you know, even a death by terror. I mean, I don't know. We don't know where that's going to go. We shouldn't be. That's the worst thing it can do is kill this body, but know where we're going. Face death with reality and with confidence and with strength. Let's take the uh, rejection, the fear of being rejected. You know, the world system, as I've already said in a couple of sermons, it's the sap principle. If you believe this, you are a big sap. The, the world's principle of living is status, appearance, performance. You have to have the status. You have to have the degrees from the right universities. You have to have the right professions, right? The in ones change from time to time. Or your appearance. You know, we all have had been rejected by better looking people, you know. Uh, we've been passed over for promotions. We've been rejected in relationships because we don't appear the way we are. And, it, you know, one of the things about out in the desert I don't like is people really buy into the appearance thing. And. Uh, all the money they spend, uh, I mean, people who are 80 years old trying to look like they're 45 or 50 is crazy. But appearance or performance. Many of us, as I look at you gray-haired people, you know what that's like in the workplace. Oh, hey, when are you thinking about retiring? Or in the, uh, in the sports world, Kobe Bryant is now on his, you know, last year. Why? He's lost that step. He's lost that shot. Performance. That's the world system. And if you as a Christian buy into it, you'll do three things. You'll, number one, try to beat the system, and especially young people do, right? And you may make some strides until you hit about 50. And then it begins, it begins to catch up to you and chew you up. Chew you up. Or you uh, become cynical and just give in to it. And, you know, that person is usually a, a negative, critical, doesn't care about anything, is sour, sour grapes attitude. Or you uh, simply rebel. And if you're a rebellious person, that's what you've, you've done. That's the way you're coping with life, with the world. But that's the wrong way to do it. As a Christian, you know. You know as a Christian, God accepted you in the beloved in Christ not because of anything you did, not because of your good looks, not because of your degree, not because of your ethnicity, not because of your gender, nothing. It's the marvelous saving grace of God that accepted you in the beloved unconditionally in Christ. And because of that, you're secure in that relationship. Now, I, I believe that you can never lose your salvation. If you do, that's okay. We'll find out in heaven. But I think if you're... Thoroughly converted, Romans 6.17. Study that hard if you're struggling with eternal security and all of that. But when you're genuinely converted, you're secure. You're in Jesus' hands, and that's in the Father's hands, and no one can pluck you out. You're secure. But more than that, you're significant. And this is where the world will beat you up if you go into the sap principle. You are significant. You're a gifted believer priest. That in your sphere of influence, wherever you're scattered throughout the Inland Empire, Monday through Saturday, God wants to touch lives that only you can touch. I got an email just yesterday from somebody that through this act of terror, God is opening up an avenue that would not be open to me as a pastor. That's fine. That's the way it should be. You're a gifted believer priest. You're significant. Don't put it all on the platform. I think the evangelical church in America is too much driven by this platform and personality cult. You are the church, and wherever you're scattered, it's significant and important. That's why you don't need to be afraid about being rejected by the world. And then lastly, you're transparent. Fear of transparency. You know, we need to learn how to love one another. This church is no different from others that I've been in in the church in America is that we don't really love one another as we should. 
and I've taught with the, just taught the elders and the pastors about why one of the reasons is you, you need to have three ways of coming together as a church. You need the celebration, con this area where you come and worship God, and the focus is on God. It isn't, it isn't that we have a happy time with one another, but it's God. Then the mid-sized groups are those congregation-sized groups where we have fellowship. You see, if you come to this church looking for fellowship here, you will not get it. It's not meant for that, and it shouldn't be. But it's those areas of mid-sized relationships where you connect with one another. The people who have been here 15, 20 years all talk about when they came, there was that class. They, they connected. That was that mid-sized group. By the way, the reason you need that is for evangelism and assimilation. If you don't have that, you don't have adult evangelism taking place. And that's why. So when you talk about evangelism, you don't get a preacher up here to be an evangelist. You focus on the organization. And then lastly is the small groups. That's where you get d intimate. That's where your love is expressed. That's where one lady shared with me last week. Her small group is ministering to one of the sisters in a group who had an accident and needs people to bring in food. That's what it's all about. That's love. But you see, you can't learn to do that unless you experience the church in all of those different groups that are available to you then you can be transparent and authentic with one another. Well, as we close up here today, I'm, I'm sorry for the time. We've had a lot in the service, but just a few thoughts in closing. Emmanuel means God with us. And so whether it's an act of terror or whether it's any of these fears I've touched upon in your life, you need to figure out how to connect with the Word of God and allow God to be with you in that situation. That's what it means. Emmanuel, God with us. And of course, Jesus is that. And that gives us the hope. That's why we celebrate the Advent. Because this is what above and beyond anything else, the gifts, the parties, the celebrations, the events at church, it's the fact that God came to be with us through Jesus. And when Jesus left, he gave the Spirit to be with us and to help us face the fears of life. Now, this is only true if you're in the forever family of God. You see, it's not religion. It isn't Christianity versus Islam. It isn't Christianity versus any other. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. He was called the Messiah in Judaism. We call him the Christ, the anointed one in Christianity. But it's that relationship with him. And if you're here today seeking, and, and I know the events of last week traumatized many of us, if you're seeking God, my challenge to you is make sure you have a relationship with Jesus. And if you're not sure, I'll say a prayer in a moment where you could do that right where you are. But learn to take all your fears to God. I can look back over my life, and, and I've had some fears in the ministry. I mean, it, you know, being a pastor uh, is like herding feral cats. It's a challenge. And there have been challenges. And there have been times I've been afraid. And the times that I made the mistake of not taking it to God, I look back and I say, you stupid idiot. Where were you thinking? What's wrong with you? Take it to God because God wants to be with you there. It's usually in those moments we think God doesn't give a rip, but God cares and God is there. And that's what gives us all hope through the Advent season. Let's pray together with every head bowed and every eye closed. For any who are, you're not certain that if you were to die tonight, you'd go to heaven. I'd invite you to pray this prayer silently, sincerely in your heart with me, right where you are. We're not going to embarrass you in any way, but we want you to be part of the forever family of God. And the prayer is this, Lord Jesus, I need you. I confess I'm a sinner. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Be my Savior and Lord. Heavenly Father, we come to you now and uh, I pray for all in this room who have a fear, whatever that might be, the fear of the terrorists or some other fear in their life right now that's a cloud on the horizon or maybe it's a storm in their life right now. God, Forgive us for uh, trying your patience. 
and help us to learn how to love you and to walk in your ways on this thing too so that as we expose it to your word that you will help us to see how you're there with us thank you that we can cast all our cares on you because you care for us in Jesus name we pray amen